Good morning again, and thank you for coming, even though if you knew I was speaking. <laughs> Margaret asked me this morning is how I got involved in this. I told her I would explain it. I got a phone call about two weeks ago, and Pat Fair had called me and asked me to speak at the United Women of Faith at Agape United Methodist Church. I made a so feeble attempt to get out of it that she convinced me that I was the right person to speak. She wanted to speak about my faith. I had told her that probably every woman in that group has more faith than I do. Well, she, my name keep, kept coming up and they wanted me to speak anyway. So here I am, that's how I got here. And what's the most unusual thing is two days afterwards, Tanya sent me a message asking me to preach today. I thought, what, what, what is this? I mean, what did I do wrong? So I just wrote back and I said, if I can talk about faith, that's what I was talking about Thursday, I'll do it. She responded, yes, of course, you can talk about faith. I was going to do the same sermon, the same message, but I thought, Pat, Pat James, if she was here, and my wife Jan would just walk out. <laughs> Once is enough, for heaven's sake. During our, when we had uh, the Bible study several years ago, um, I was in a Hope Bible study, and one time, uh, towards the end of one of the classes, something came up. I don't remember what it was. And I had just, I remember saying, someday I'll tell that story. Today is someday. I don't want you to feel bad or have sympathy for me. This is not a sob story. It's just a part of history and a memory. There's no bragging involved. Please don't listen to this as I'm bragging. I have nothing to brag about. This was my sermon is when I first became a lay speaker in 2002. I was the last one to speak in the class of 15. It was nerve-wracking to wait. I was last, and um, I had some very constructive criticism on him, which I corrected immediately. And we had the longest question and answer period that the instructor had ever seen. So I guess it meant something. After that, I gave the message to about three United Methodist churches in the area. So the title of my sermon is Assume, Hope, and Faith. We assume things all day long, every day, all the time. You turn on a light switch, you expect it to turn on. You turn on a faucet, you expect water to come out of it. You go out to your car. I know Carolyn, she goes out to her car, she assumes her car's gonna start. It's a Buick. <laughs> My friend George, on the other hand, he goes out to his car, he's gotta hope it's gonna start. It's a Kia. <laughs> we also hope that the sale items that are in the stores, they're, they're in stock. They're on sale, we wanna buy them, we hope they're there. We also hope that we have enough money to live on. That's a worry and a hope. We hope for a sunny, sunny day. We hope for the weather to be nice when we have an outdoor event planned or scheduled. That we hope for. Assuming and hope is great to have. You need them. We use them every day. And when the day of the month when our Social Security checks get deposited, I hope I get to the checking account before Jan does. <laughs> Faith is different. Faith is stronger, faith is deeper, faith is wider. Faith encompasses all. We, we, we reach for it at different points of our lives, times of troubles, desperation, worry. We reach for it in times of health. We reach for it over the loss of loved ones. I believe that as time goes on, I could speak for myself in this, I used to worry a lot. I don't worry so much anymore. I think my faith has taken over to worry. Before I tell you about the event that is my, is my sermon, I have to explain to you my athletic abilities as a young boy on a scale of one to five or one to 10 was zero. You won't believe me if I just tell you, so I'm going to show you.
the first sport I tried out for was basketball. So I got my equipment together, and I went to try out for the team. What was the, what was the problem? I had my basket, and I had my ball. I know you're supposed to shoot it in a basket. Try to be funny. This is what happens. Is that okay? Um, so needless to say, I didn't make the team. I can't play basketball. So then I tried baseball. What is, what is the problem trying to hit a ball that's coming at you at 45 miles an hour directly towards your face? What's the problem with that? Art, this is a Red Sox ball. Is that okay? Is that the best team? <laughs> so I've got the bat. It gives me the heebie-jeebies. I'm supposed to hit that ball with this bat? I don't even want to hold on to it. Needless to say, I didn't make the baseball team. So then I got it. I'm going to do something simple, easy. doesn't take any brains. I went out for badminton. So I got my equipment. I got the birdie. <laughs> I got the birdie already. And I thought, what is a badminton? All I could think of was a badminton is a glove that went their separate ways. I brought all kinds of gloves with me. Unbeknownst to me, I, I didn't make the team. I'm not even going to mention football. So what happened to me on a beautiful spring day, March 15th, 1988, I was doing the banking for the company I was working for, as I had done for about eight years and two or three times a week. I got in one of three cars. I took the same route there every day and at the same time. That's a mistake. Don't do that. Alternate your routes, your times, whatever becomes habit. Change it. I was a victim of assault and battery. They wanted the uh, envelope. Instinctively, no training, I resisted. I was pushed to the back of the building where they thought they could attack me more. I resisted going back there, and I asked God for help. I screamed it. I don't know if I vocally screamed it or just inside my head. But I screamed to God to please help me, tell me what to do, I'll do anything you say, I don't know what to do. I'm in, I'm in fear of my life. They grabbed the bag, money bag away from me, even though I was trying to hold on to it, and God answered me almost instantly. I heard him, I felt him. God told me to stand up, punch a guy ten times in the face, and walk into the bank. Help is on the way. I did that. I stood up, pushed the guy that was two, there were two guys. Did I mention that? I pushed the guy that was behind me. I pushed him away from me, and I started punching the guy that was in front of me. He was, anyways, I hit him one time right below the eye. I hit him again, the side of the nose. I didn't hit the nose. I missed it. I hit him another time right above the forehead. And I hit him another time right in the same spot below his eye. It had turned red. I was making an impact. God told me to hit him 10 times. I only did four. I was jumped by the other guy again, and he was twisting my arms behind my back. That It was, it was somewhat painful. I was threatened, I believe, with a knife. I sensed I was going to get stabbed. I braced myself for a stabbing. 
I don't know how you do that. It was just, it's, it's in the mind. This all happened in an instant. I mean, I could talk about it for half an hour, but it was minutes. After the guy grabbed my hands behind my back, I couldn't hang on to the bag anymore, so it was taken from me again. I had possession of it twice. Well, after that event, um, I did suffer a sore back and a sore arm for several days, and I also, in the process, broke my left index finger in three spots, and that took several months to heal. It bothered me for years in the wintertime because it was so painful in the cold. But anyways, that's, that's fine. Um, I stopped at church several times on the way home and asked, I, I actually, to be honest with you, I yelled at God the first couple of times. You know, why did this happen to me? Why? I made a covenant with God, a promise, a commitment, that I would never let that happen to me or anyone I was with. If it did happen, the outcome was going to be entirely different. So I thought I would go take shooting lessons and carry a gun. I had a plan. I was going to go on my left ankle with a one-button snap, and all I had to do was tell the guy that had a gun pointed at me, excuse me, I have to inch my ankle, pull out the gun, and shoot him, all before he shoots me. Doesn't make sense. I had spoken to my two previous pastors. I spoke to my pastor. I spoke to many people. Uh, everyone was talking me out of that. They didn't want to visit me in prison. I really, really, really wasn't prison material. So I scrapped that idea. There was a man in our class that taught karate. Now, if the, my high school took a survey of who's the least likely to take karate classes, the name Ed Noose would have came up. I talked to the, his name was Bob. I talked to Bob one day after Sunday and I told him I was thinking about taking karate. He said, great, come on down to two classes, free of charge, decide what you want to do, you'll Get out of it whatever you put in. So I was out of my comfort zone every minute of karate class. I went, I sat down, I was just going to watch the first time. I thought, no, oh, the watching isn't going to teach me a darn thing. So I went through the classes. I went through the ranks, white belt. That's okay, that knows something. And then I got promoted to the um, yellow belt. That's better. I started sparring with the yellow belt. I, my mission was to learn to fight to protect myself and those with me. So I sparred every chance I got. After, every, after, after not every class, but most classes, from 9 to 9.30, there was sparring available, actual fighting, actually hitting, not pretend hitting. Um, I did very poorly. I got hit many times. I had hundreds of bruises on me. During the process, I had two ni very nice fat lips. I got to like applesauce. I, uh, oh, I got my glasses broken. I was an idiot, and I fought with my glasses on at first. I learned that really quick. That fight was stopped. I wanted that fight to go on so bad, I pleaded with the sensei, the uh, karate instructor's name, is, we call him sensei, I pleaded with him, let me continue to fight. He goes, no, you're agitated, you're, you're on edge, you're upset. I'm, I'm not, I'm, it's fine. I'm not angry. Well, it couldn't go on in my pieces of glass. <laughs> it was all over the place. The whole class helped clean it up so nobody would cut themselves on our bare feet. So I progressed to the orange belt, and I sparred even more, more aggressively, more powerful. In fact... You probably won't believe this, knowing me. When the class ended and you wanted to, um, you wanted to spar, if you were told to sit on the edges of the do dojo, is the karate gym, and wait to be called. Well, I did that a few times, so 
but I was called second or third or last. So I started one day, I just stood, I stood at the middle of the class, I just raised my hand. He goes, Ed, what are you doing? Pick me, I want to be first. <laughs> it's totally out of my character, completely out. God was with me. I had faith, not to win, but to learn something, to be successful, to be confident in something. I proceeded through that process, and one day, un totally unbeknownst to me, usually we knew about nights of promotions, unbeknownst completely to me, I'm just working out, did my two sparring matches, um, oh, I didn't tell you, one. I, my injuries were two fat lips, broken glasses, hundreds of black and blue and yellow marks all over my body, some from hitting and some from blocking, more from hitting. And I broke my ankle, I was, uh, I was knocked down and I broke and chipped my ankle bone. I was out of karate for three months. I went back. So the one night we're there, and um, he set everybody aside. He goes, we're, we're having a promotion. I'm like, oh, okay, I don't, I don't, nothing was mentioned. And he called me for, to stand in front of the class. I thought, well, what, what are we doing? And he told me to do the, the green belt, or the, the orange belt kata. That's the movement. Bailey, am I saying, am I doing okay? In case you don't know what I'm going to tell her, I'm going to embarrass Bailey, but she has a black belt in karate. Very impressive. And I already knew that. I asked her to demonstrate today, but she has a dress on, she can't do that. <laughs> Anyways, um, it was me. It was a surprise promotion, and I did the kata. I made a bad mistake. I hadn't practiced. I wasn't ready for it. I pr usually practice, they tell you two weeks in advance you're having the promotions and, you know, be ready. I wasn't ready. I get up there and I, I made a mistake. I thought, oh. I did what they do with the Olympics. The gymnasts, I watch a lot of that this year. They make a mistake, they keep on going. How do you do that? That's got to be so disappointing, so frustrating, because you can do those exercises 100 times perfectly, and the one time that matters, you make a mistake. This was it. So I finished it. I went back. I was going to go sit at the sideline. Sensei tells me, get up in front. Go again. Well, I don't think you get too many chances, second chance. Start when you're, start when you're ready. The room was silent. Everybody's watching me. I'm a nervous wreck. I don't want to make the same mistake again. I had to think, be nervous, sweat my brains out, and ask God for help all at the same moment. I asked God for help. Give me faith. Give me strength. Give me the power. Give me the courage to get this done. I did it. I received my green belt that night. I was very proud. My sensei told me after church on Sunday, he gave me a card to carry in my wallet that this man has his arms and feet are weapons in case of self-defense. I carry that in my wallet for years. He told me what would save my life is my front snap kick. I was a very good fighter. I had come a long way from my first day walking into that class. It was really an amazing journey and un totally uncharacteristic of me. He also gave me a large poster I hung in my office that worked for a, a couple of years, give, granting me all the honor and privilege of having a green belt in karate. At the age of 38, let me mind you, my opponents were all in the, between 18 and 24. They were faster than me. They were stronger than me. I had one thing, one advantage. I had faith. Not that I would win, but that I would finish the fight, I would learn something, and I would go on. 
I have to tell you one thing I did. I have to be honest. I have to make a confession. I knew the guys were out for blood, and once in a while they told me when we got in a ring, I'm out for blood, Grandpa. I asked them, please don't call me Grandpa. I asked them in the locker room, don't call me Grandpa. You can call me Ed, Eddie Spaghetti, Reddy Eddie, Eddie the Jerk, whatever you want to do. Don't call me Grandpa. I'm not your Grandpa. It irritated me. So he comes up to me and he says to me, I'm out for blood, Grandpa. I said, okay, fine. So just before the match, I told him, I saw your girlfriend last night walking her dog. And he asked me, how do you know where she lives? How do you know she had a dog? I said, the real question is, which one is the dog? <laughs> he became angry. Now he had an emotion. I had another advantage. If you can get somebody to laugh or be angry with you, and you're concentrating on a fight, that's an advantage. So I had knowledge, I had no emotion, I had faith. He charged me, I knew he was going to, because he was angry. I made three steps back, lifted my knee into his midsection as hard as I could. He went down, he was he knocked the wind out of him. I won the match. So after that, I went up to the guy, you know, you're not supposed to apologize, you're not supposed to uh, say you're sorry, you're not supposed to congratulate, there's no clapping, there's no congratulating, it's serious stuff. So I went up to him, told him, and said, I said, now you got to go home and tell your mama that you got beat up by grandpa. <laughs> it may sound mean, but it was a cutthroat business, and he was 20 years younger than me. got to figure out where I am. Well, I just want to, I'll just say this. I, it was taking too long to figure out where I am. Several years after that, I, I resigned after a few more months after my green belt. I, I didn't spar much, and I was afraid of getting hurt, and I would have. I've seen people get black eyes. I've seen a guy, uh, he was a very good fighter. I think his name was Paul. He was a uh, blue belt, which is next. A uh, very good fighter. Um, I saw him get hit right on the nose. We wore white geese, and his gi turned red instantly. It's amazing. Anyways, for several years after that, uh, whenever Jane was upset with me, you know, two or three times a day, she would call me, she would try to insult me and say, you're nothing but a karate school dropout. I never felt that way. I, I, made, I made a mission with the promise, the commitment, the covenant that I made with God, and I felt I reached that goal, and I didn't go a day, I didn't leave a day sooner or a day later than I thought I needed to. My sensei told me that the next, the next three guys that try to attack you are going to be in trouble. I said, there were only two. He goes, well, those two are going to need backup. <laughs> so assume we can assume anything. Let's assume the mundane, the mundane things that we don't need to think about. Let's have hope. Hope for the future. Hope that everything goes right. But when it comes down to it, let's keep the faith. Let's keep the faith for when we need it. Let's always keep it. If you can't keep it to your heart, keep it an arm's length away. Keep God and your faith within an arm's reach. I do that, and I hope you do it too. I'm sure you do. Keep God and your faith at an arm's reach. You never know when you're going to need to reach for that and bring it in. God will be with you. God will help you. I know he's helped me many times. You can always have faith with God. He will help you through any difficulties. Maybe not solve it, 
but help you endure what you must, be able to accept what you have to, and move on. I brought uh, a bowl of faith stones today. Uh, I, I don't know if Jan has them with her in the back, but you can look at these as a stone with the word faith on it. Or you can look at it as I do, a symbol of strength, power, hardness, toughness, unbreakable with the human hands, and stronger than anything else you can imagine. You can't see faith, but in time of need, I hope you can feel it. Amen.